You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, if you don't already know, my name is Connor. I am, uh, I'm the pastor here at Temple Baptist Church, the teaching pastor. I'm the one that does the majority of the talking. Um, and so I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And I would also like to, before we go any further, um, just have us also pray for just a moment. I want to pray uh, and just thank God for who he is and what he's given us and the gift of being able to gather as a church family. I want to pray continually uh, for an end to this uh, all of this pandemic and everything that comes with it. Uh, I want to pray for the sick, uh, specifically a church member of ours that's been diagnosed with a uh, pretty serious uh, disease. Uh, I want to pray for uh, the sanctity of life um, and the fact that today is a day that our nation, that many in our nation have um, uh, designated as the day specifically to draw awareness to the sanctity of life, and they call it Sanctity of Life Sunday, and we pray for the unborn, and we lift them up, um, pray for their protection, um, and for an end to abortion. Um, we also, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and uh, it's a day uh, that we want to pray for continued work in the work that Martin Luther King Jr. and many, 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 many others uh, did uh, throughout the civil rights era. And so would you just join me in prayer at this time before we go into the Word of God? And if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. Almighty God, whose mercy is over all your works, first and foremost this morning, we praise you for the blessings which have been brought to mankind by your holy church throughout, throughout all the world. We bless you for drawing us into fellowship with your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, by the operation of the Holy Spirit in the preaching of the gospel, in the teaching of the scriptures, in the faithful use of the sacraments, uh, whereby we are made one body and each of us members one of another. We thank you for the holy example of your saints in all ages, especially those who have gone on before us. We thank you for these servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear and for the memory and the example of all that has been true and good in their lives. And Father, we, frankly, we humbly ask you this morning that we may be numbered with those faithfully departed saints in the great company of the redeemed in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Most mighty and merciful God, as we continue in this global pandemic and time of great sickness with COVID-19, we, we run to you for help. We beg of you to help us, to deliver us, please, from this trial and all that comes with it. All of the mandates and the changes in the mandates and the things that just make us go, <sighs> Give strength and skill to all those who are working to help the sick and find a cure, especially the doctors and nurses on the front lines. God, I also want to pray for, pray for those who are sick with diseases and viruses and illnesses uh, that are totally separate from COVID-19. And this morning, a, a new one has been brought to my awareness, uh, Connie Diaz, who's been diagnosed with something called trigeminal neuralgia, uh, which is just a severe, severe pain in the head that goes into uh, the, the, the ear and the jaw and the cheekbones and um, is absolutely debilitating and makes it almost impossible to do anything else. And medications are not really working the way that they're supposed to. And there's more tests that are going to be run this week. And God, we pray for complete and total healing. We pray for wisdom for her doctors. And we pray that you would give her the grace to honor and glorify you even in the midst of this excruciating trial. And Father, grant to us, all of us, the ability to perceive how frail and uncertain our life is and that we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, today, January 16th, has come to be known in our country as Sanctity of Life Sunday, a day to remember those unborn lives who have tragically been lost to abortion and to stand up for their future protection. In addition, tomorrow our nation celebrates Martin Luther King Day, a day to celebrate how far we've come as a nation in the area of justice for our black and brown brothers and sisters and fellow citizens, but also a day to mourn and stand up for the great work that is still to be done in the way of racial reconciliation. So today I pray for justice, O oh God. O oh God, who will one day set your glory among the nations and cause all the peoples to see the judgments of your right hand, they will realize that you truly are king. Have mercy upon those who are persecuted by those who are wicked and unrighteous. We specifically lift up the unborn and those communities of color in our nation who continue to suffer injustices from those charged with their protection. And so cause justice to prevail among men, that the meek may inherit the earth, as you said in your Sermon on the Mount, and the redeemed praise you for your deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, we also want to pray for your church, your church universal or Catholic this morning. Look favorably upon the body of your entire church. Specifically, I want to start praying for churches that are in our community. So this morning, I want to lift up First Baptist Church of Paris, a historically uh, 
predominantly black church in our community that was around, that's been around for over a hundred years. I pray for her pastor, Pastor Terry Wells and his wife. I pray also for Paris Valley Church and her pastor, Chris Thompson. And by your eternal providence, accomplish the salvation of man through your church throughout the world and especially throughout this community. That all of Paris, California, the United States and the world may see and know that what was fallen has been lifted up. What was grown old has been made new and that all things are restored by him through whom they were made, even your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then almighty God, I ask you to bless Temple Baptist Church and its people. Forgive us of our many and grievous sins. Draw us nearer to yourself. Cause true religion to increase and abound among us. Prosper the reading and the preaching of your word this morning and always. And bless all of the ministries of this church. Give patience to the sick and the afflicted and ultimately, ultimately make their sufferings a blessing to them. Hear us for the sake of him who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord, and it's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we are continuing in our study of the one another commands that we find littered all throughout the New Testament. Last week, we looked at Jesus' command in John chapter 13, uh, all the way through John chapter 15, which is where Jesus is sitting down with his disciples at the Last Supper, and uh, over and over and over again, he gives them this command, love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. It's a command that he actually gave in one conversation. He gave this command five times to his disciples. And if that wasn't enough to show us how important this command was, we're going to look at that command again five more times in three other books of the New Testament. And here's why. The simple truth, I'm sorry, three other chapters of the New Testament. And here's why. The simple truth is this. God equals love. God equals love. That may sound trite to some. That may sound cliche to some. And our world certainly loves to take that Bible verse and sort of throw it at us, right? People that are unassociated and do not love the Lord and do not love the church. And they say, oh, you got to be careful. God is love, right? Your God is love, right? Yes, but not love is defined by anyone else other than God himself and the scriptures that he has given to us. But God does, in fact, equal love. God is love. We are able to belong to God because of the supreme act of love that was demonstrated in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that we are in Christ. We know that we are actually Christians by our love for others. On top of that, others are brought into the family of God because of our love for each other, right? Jesus made that abundantly clear as we saw last week. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. Not if you have all the right doctrine. Not if you go to conservative political rallies, not if you stand outside of an abortion clinic, not if you do any number of things. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So you can do all the activism, you can say all the right things, you can believe all the right things. And as 1 Corinthians says, and yet if you lack love, you might as well just be a giant piece of metal just constantly being banged on. And you're like, yeah, stop. That's annoying. You get on my nerves. You're irritating. Get out. Get, get away from me. I'm calling the police. I'm calling code enforcement for a, for a noise disturbance. That's all you are. If you have all the right stuff and you lack love. And we're going to talk about all of that this morning, but the message surrounding love, although it's incredibly profound, it's also pretty simple. A Christianity that is devoid of love isn't actually Christianity. <laughs> so here's the deal. God is love. And this should be perhaps the most convicting and yet at the same time the most encouraging and reassuring truths in all of the Bible. And my prayer is we look one more time at this command to love one another is twofold. Here are the two ways that I'm praying for God to use this command within our body of believers or within the people that attend this church. First, I'm praying that those who are outside of the love of God would realize that they're outside of the love of God and come to experience that love. Secondly, I'm praying that those who have experienced the love of God would be reminded of it, would be encouraged by it, and would be encouraged about 
whose you are, who you belong to. Not because you're great, not because you do all the right things, not because you have all the right beliefs on paper, no, 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 but because of whose you are, because of what Christ has done for you and you are in him. And all that you have because of what he has done for you. That's my prayer, is that this morning and then throughout these one another commands and really throughout the rest of your life here on this earth, you would be reminded again and again and again and encouraged by the fact that you are loved purely and genuinely and infinitely more than you could ever imagine because of what Christ has done for you. If you are in Christ, I want you to be encouraged and reassured this morning and always that you are loved loved. And I want us to start looking at that by simply reading two little bit longer passages of scripture together this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd love it if you would pull them out and actually turn there with me. Just the reference is going to be up on the screen. The words are not. And so if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to pull it out. If you want to use one of the Bibles that's in front of you, great. That's why they're there. I'd love it if they were getting used. So it's worth the money that we spent on them now. So if you'll pull that out and you want to turn to page 1083, Okay, 1,083 or 1,083, okay? 1 John chapter 3 is where we're going to be looking. Verse number 11 or page 1,083 in one of those pew Bibles. And now I'm going to turn there and give you a little extra time. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11. And I want you to just listen to the words of the Apostle John as he talks about the love of the Savior. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Verse 12, unlike Cain, so he's going all the way back to Genesis, and he's showing that love is what has defined the work of God from Genesis all the way to the end now, okay? Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know, there's a confidence there, an assurance there. We know that we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. He is outside of God. He is outside of a relationship with God. In other words, he is outside of the love of God. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. He doesn't say everyone who kills his brother and sister is a murderer. Everyone who just doesn't like them, who treats them with contempt. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. He's not a Christian. No matter what he says, no matter what beliefs he has. Verse 16, this is how we have come to know love. We sang about it a moment ago. There is no greater love. This is how we've come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has the world's goods and sees a fellow believer, someone within our church or another church, sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? So if you see that somebody has a need, especially a brother or sister in Christ, you see they have a need, you can do something about it, and you're like, I'll let somebody else deal with it. It says, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. Don't offer a bunch of lip service. We all say that we hate this, right? We, all, we, we always put people on TV and have news articles about them and put them in the paper and have social media posts. When we say, that person didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk right? We love that. We say that's what we value. We say that's what we cherish in others. And yet how often are we so guilty of doing the exact same thing? And the opposite of that, we just talk the talk and we don't walk the walk. Little children, let us not love in word or truth. Don't just talk the talk, but in action and truth, walk the walk. This is how we will know. Again, we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him when our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. Now, this is the command that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands remains in him and he in him, 
And the way we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given us. Now, jump over to chapter four, verse number seven. He goes on, dear friends, let us love one another. Why? Because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. It's not a trite cliche, even though people use it as if it is. This is the holy, inerrant, inspired, sufficient word of God making plainly clear God is love. God's love was revealed, verse 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And then he tells us what love consists of in verse 10. Consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son as the world's savior. So whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. You see how he's trying to kind of beat this drum and he's almost kicking a dead horse a little bit. He's going on and on and on because he wants to drill it in to our thick skulls. God is love. You want to know if you're a Christian? You want to know if you're in God? How's your love? In this, God is, verse 17, in this, God is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love. Fear specifically of death, of judgment, of punishment. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. Why do we love? Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he is, who he has seen, right? Get this. This is important. For the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. We are image bearers, right? Right? God created us, as he says, in his image, the Latin phrase that's often used. We are the imago Dei. Every living, breathing human being on this planet, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of skin color, regardless of background, regardless of their past lives, they are the imago Dei. They are in the image of God. When we fail to love those in the image of God, which is the only way we can see physically God, right? Because God cannot be seen. We just saw that. The only way then we love, when we love other people that are created in the image of God, that's the only way we see God physically. We are, in effect, loving God. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has not seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. Here's where I'll end. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. There was a lot packed into there, I know, into both of those passages. And I'm not sure if you noticed it or not, but there is one overarching theme that runs through that entire section on love, and it's this, assurance. You can know, you can know, you can know. Confidence, confidence, confidence. You can reassure your hearts. It's this idea of assurance over and over again. And that's primarily what I want to talk to you about this morning. That love, biblically speaking, as defined in scripture, love leads to assurance. What does that mean? Well, let me start by doing this. How many of you grew up in a church where you went to Christian summer camps, uh, youth conferences, winter retreats, that kind of a thing? Okay. Help me out this morning. If you're an anti-hand raiser today, just put a break in it. Raise your hand with me. If you're somebody that grew up in a church like that, going to summer camps, winter retreats, youth conference, just raise your hand for me real quick. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good third of you. Okay. Now, uh, and how many of you saw people at the end of some of those services go up and there was kind of like a big deal about making decisions or something like that? 
Okay, great. Now, how many of you maybe saw people go up there and make a decision and they, and they came back and maybe there was a thing at church where they would come up and they would say, they would announce to their church family or their youth group or whatever, this is the decision that I made. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to, I got saved. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to serve people. I'm going to obey my mom and dad, whatever, right? But then somebody would come up or maybe a couple people would come up and they would say something like, I got reassurance of my salvation. How many of you have ever heard somebody use that term before? Right. Now, I want to be gentle here uh, because I know there's probably plenty of people in here that maybe that's an experience that you had or something. Um, I'm afraid sometimes that those situations, specifically around this idea of getting reassurance of our salvation, um, a lot of those situations are based on unbiblical things. They're based on maybe praying a prayer again that you don't find in the Bible. They're based on having an emotional experience, and not that anything is wrong with having an emotional experience. I think it's great to have an emotional experience with God. But if we base our entire faith and our, our standing before God on an emotional experience alone, that's really shaky ground. Or we base our assurance of our salvation on a feeling we have at one time and then don't have at another time, and therefore we feel like we need to go and may have this feeling again, and we have to go conjure it up somehow through exciting worship, through robust preaching, through a mountaintop experience, or whatever the case is. And I'm okay with having robust preaching and exciting worship and mountaintop. I'm okay with all of that. But when we base our standing before God and the assurance of our salvation on a feeling, that is really, really shaky ground. And what can actually happen is the opposite of gaining assurance of our salvation, where we're constantly wondering. Because what we've based our salvation on is a, is a feeling and an experience, an emotional experience at one time. So when that emotion goes away, or changes, or that feeling changes or goes away, now we're left going, I don't feel it anymore. Maybe I'm not saved again. And so what happens then in a lot of those places, if you, were, if you saw this, you saw the same kid coming back every year getting reassurance of his salvation. When in reality, he's not sure at all where he stands before God. And he doesn't know how to be sure of where he stands before God. And it's really not a kind way of helping people be confident in in. in where they stand before God. And some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I wasn't raised in a church like that. Okay, but you probably still know what I'm getting at. Let me explain. So many Christians, after they become Christians, especially after they've been a Christian for a while, they'll start to have these moments or these seasons of doubt. Maybe you've been there and you think things like, I felt like a Christian for a little while, right? Because especially when you first become a Christian, for most people, you're in kind of this cage stage uh, mentality where you're like, I got to tell everybody about this. I'm pumped about it. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to tell everybody else to come to church. I'm going to bring my friends to church. I'm going to tell my parents. And you go on and on and on. You're so excited and it's great, right? And then all of a sudden, after some time, maybe a few weeks or months or even years, it starts to just sort of wane a little bit and those kinds of things. And you start to think, man, am I a Christian? Why don't I feel the way I used to feel? Um, am I really saved? Um, do I need to pray a prayer again? Uh, did I really mean it when I prayed? You know what I'm talking about, maybe? Well, let me tell you this. There's a reason that God never said, pray this prayer and you'll get saved. Pray this prayer and you'll be my child. Nowhere in the Bible. There's a reason instead that God graciously has given, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying that prayer shouldn't be attached to lots of other things. Okay, it should be. We see that all throughout scripture. But there is a reason that God graciously gave us these objective means of grace to help us be confident in where we are with him. Things that are outside of ourselves that we can point to. We don't have to base our salvation on how we felt at any given moment. He gave us baptism as an objective means of grace in that when we come to the baptismal waters with repentance and faith and are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, we have lovingly been given a gift from God that is outside of ourselves that we can look back to again and again and again. Not to the moment we felt a feeling, not to the moment when we prayed any particular prayer, but to a moment that we came to these waters where God says, believe and be baptized. And we said, I believe. I believe that God is who he said he is. I believe that he did what he said he did. And I'm being baptized. I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning to Christ through the waters of baptism. 
And he says, that is what we point to again and again and again. So that way, even when we don't feel like it sometimes, we say, did I come to those waters in repentance and faith and get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Yes. Okay, that is the only physical marker by which we are given to say we have walked through the door into the family or the kingdom of God. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's a loving, gracious gift from our Heavenly Father. This is also why I want us to take the Lord's Supper more often as well. When we come to the Lord's Supper week after week after week, we're basically doing what I just said. We're, ba uh, we're basically looking back to our baptism and we're saying, I've gone through that door. I've entered the kingdom. I'm a part of the family and I belong at that dinner table. I belong there. I'm part of that family. That's why I get to be there. When we observe the Lord's table, we're living a life of repentance for the sins that caused our Savior's body to be broken and his blood to be shed. By faith, we're spiritually feasting upon Christ and we're remembering all that we gained when we were baptized into him. So God has given us these objective means outside of ourselves of grace so that we don't have to go walking around hoping we meant something enough. But then scripture gives us these commands about love to help us even go a step further. Help us evaluate our lives even further when those, darts, when those doubts start to seep into our minds. Because the other thing we have to be careful of, right, is, is having to say, well, I got dunked under some water and I ate a cracker and drank some juice, so I'm good. It's like, well, no, that's, that's not true either though, right? And so he gives us one more thing in scripture that just is not, an, is not a work, Right? Baptism isn't a work that you do. Baptism is a work that's done to you. So you're completely passive. You stand there in the water and you just hope the guy's not going to hold you under too long, right? He dunks you under that water. They're not your water. You're not dunking yourself. Somebody else is doing it. And that is the gift of God. This is not something you're doing. This is something that God has given to us. He broke his body. He shed his blood. The elders of the church give you the body and blood of Christ and so on and so forth. So we have to be careful though on the flip side of that, that we don't then just go and say, well, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I got dunked in some water. I had the cracker. I had the juice. And so sometimes fears will still start to, and doubts will still start to seep in a little bit. The enemy comes along. Come on, man. You just keep messing up. You keep sinning. You keep doing what you know you shouldn't do. And you keep not doing the stuff you know you should do. How can you call yourself a Christian? You're not really saved. You're not really part of the family. Just give up, man. But God was gracious enough to give us another tool to evaluate our Christian lives and give us reassurance biblically of our salvation. And that tool is, how's your love? Do you love one another? The reassuring benefits of loving one another are listed again and again and again in 1 John. Let's look at them together. Number one, loving one another shows that we have inherited, that we have received eternal life. Look at verse 13. Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because why? We, four-letter word, starts with L, ends with E, love, okay? We know that we have passed from death to life because we, okay, we're going to try it again. We know we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Loving one another shows that we have inherited eternal life. Do you have love? Or do you hate your brothers and sisters? Do you struggle with that? Is there something we need to repent of? Number two, loving one another reassures our hearts that we belong to the truth when our hearts condemn us. Look at verse 19. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Loving one another reassures our hearts that we belong to the truth when our hearts come and that enemy comes and goes, they just keep messing up. Yeah, you're right, I do. Because I can't do this perfectly until the day I stand before God. But I can see, I know, I came to those baptismal waters in repentance and faith. 
I am weekly coming to the table that I know I belong to and I'm repenting of my sins and I'm, and I'm receiving the body and blood of Christ that was broken and shed for me. And God is actively, as he has loved me, is actively working in me to love others. Do you see how it's all the work of God? It's all the work of God from beginning to end. But there's these things that he's graciously given us to see when our hearts condemn us, look back to what Christ has done. Number three, loving one another allows us to experience answered prayer. First John chapter three, verse 21. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, um, Yeah, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. I'm, yeah, I want to be careful not to get too far into uh, why certain prayers do and don't get answered, but according to scripture, this is how we receive answered prayer, by there is love toward one another as God has loved us. Um, Number four, loving one another shows that we know God. First John chapter four. Uh, Verses seven and eight. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love God does not know God because God is, God is love. Loving one another, uh, fifthly, loving one another gives us confidence in the day of judgment. Look at chapter four and verse 17. In In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is coming a day when God is going to judge all those who are outside of himself. We don't need to lay awake at night going, biting our nails and knocking our knees, going, I wonder if I'm going to make it. I wonder if I'm going to be okay. God doesn't want you to live that way. He wants you to live in confidence. He wants you to live in a confident assurance of who you are and who you belong to. And the fact that if you are in his love, you're safe, you're okay. So don't spend all your time worrying about what's going to happen on the day of judgment. Spend your time living, loving others as Christ has loved you. We can be confident in the day of judgment. Number six, loving one another drives out the fear of punishment. This kind of goes along with the last one. But verse 18, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. And number seven, loving one another proves to ourselves and to others that we truly love God. Look at verse 20. Chapter four, if anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. So don't try to fool yourself of all people. If you're saying, I hate my brother or sister, regardless of who that may be, we've got to do some serious self-evaluation. We've got to get on our knees before God. If anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. It's strong language. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has not seen cannot love God whom he has, who he has seen, I'm sorry, uh, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. And we can cross-reference that with what we heard Jesus say last week in the Gospel of John. Again, by this will all men know you're my disciples. This is how others are going to know that you're a Christian as well. If you love one another. But if you don't love one another, nobody's going to believe you. Or nobody's going to believe Christianity as a whole and they're going to think it's a pretty worthless religion if it can't even make you live rightly with your brother and sister in the world. And we're not given an answer exactly to, all right, how much love is enough love? (laughs) And I think that's on purpose. But what we can know for sure is that if there is no love, we don't know God. So you want to know if you're a Christian who should have confidence in where you stand with God? Have you been baptized in repentance and faith? Are you coming to the table again in repentance? God, I'm sorry for what, it's required, what, what was required from my sin. However, I'm also rejoicing in the fact that you broke your body and shed your blood and you've given, me, you've given that to me. And Jesus said, if you don't eat my body, you don't drink my blood, you're not gonna have eternal life. Have, in repentance and faith, have you been baptized? Are you coming again and again to the table in repentance and faith? and feasting upon the body and blood of Christ? And are you loving your brother and sister in Christ as God has loved you? So first and foremost, have you been baptized into Christ Jesus, which shows that you have repented and believed in him? If the answer is no, you simply need to come to Christ. You need to turn from your sin. You need to believe on him alone. 
If the answer is yes, then great. How are you walking in love toward others? I'm going to end with this. There's a a man by the name of Matthew Henry. Some of you may know who that is. Others, if you don't, he was a well-known and hugely influential pastor in England in the 16 and 1700s. His writings are still very popular 400 years later. And I love what he says about these passages in his commentary. Here's what he says about the love that's talked about in loving one another in 1 John chapter 3 and 4. This obedience to love one another, though utterly insufficient for our justification, Okay? It's not a work saying that, anyway, it's, it's utterly insufficient for our justification. This obedience proves that we dwell in him and he in us. The love of God in Christ produced in the hearts of Christians by the spirit of adoption is the great proof of conversion. This must be tried by its effects on their temper and conduct toward other people. If a man professes, if a man says that he loves God and yet indulges resentment or shows a selfish disposition, he gives his whole profession of faith a lie. The member of Christ has much of God visible in him. Okay, this goes back to the Imago Dei. So every one of your brothers and sisters within the church of God has the Imago Dei, has the image of God in him. You can see God by looking at your brothers and sisters in Christ. So then he goes on. How then shall the hater of a visible image of God pretend to love the invisible God himself? How can he love God who habitually breaks his commands and and acts contrary to his example? Let us then pray without ceasing that we may more entirely love him who hath first loved us. And if it is evident that our natural enmity is changed into affection and gratitude, let us bless the name of our God for this seal and earnest of eternal happiness. In return for his mercy and in obedience to his commandment, let us do good to our brethren and thus show that although our love is imperfect, hear that, you're not going to do this perfectly. That's okay. We follow a savior who does do it perfectly. And thus show that although our love is imperfect, we differ from those who pretend to love God, whom they have not seen, and yet obviously hate their brethren whom they have seen. You're going to do it imperfectly. But if your heart is convicted or when a brother and sister comes to you and says, hey, I think you're, you're not acting in love and your heart's convicted and you go and repent, that's just another one of those ways of showing like, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for showing me where I'm still failing in my love, helping me grow in my love, but you're still able to see that love produced in your life. As has already been said multiple times this morning, the only way this kind of love is possible from us is because of the one who died for us. We love him, why? 1 John 4, 19, because he first loved us. If you don't yet know that love, then I'd encourage you to turn from your sin and in faith turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that turning is sealed through baptism. Again, if you'll fill out, you can, there's a little card that looks just like this. It's a, it's a little short little card. Uh, it's got a blue line at the top of it. You can find one, I think, in the back of your pews. And if you can't find it in the back of your pews, it's in the back of every pew today, uh, the, this thing with a blue line. And on the back of it, you can fill out some information and you can mark follow Jesus or baptism or both. And that just lets us know, man, we need to talk about what it means for you to follow Christ. You can drop it off with one of our pastors at the end of the service, with myself. You can leave it in one of those giving boxes that's on one of those back tables back there as you leave. We love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ, to live your life with him, to experience his love in a way that causes us to then love others. And if you do know that love, though, then I just want to encourage you to keep walking in it. Keep resting in the love that you have in Christ. Keep liberally showing that love to others, especially those within your church family, and be encouraged that as God shows his love to others through you, you can be confident that you belong to him and he will keep you safely within his care until the day that you stand before him in glory, not afraid of any kind of judgment, but in perfect confidence and rest and assurance that you are his and you will be with him now for all of eternity. Let's pray.